appreciate you. Um, this one was just part of really that last announcement, which is that, um, well, like I said, there's the book, there's the classes that we're running on Tuesday nights. Some people have asked me if we were going to live stream it, and we are. We're going to live stream it. Um, so you can tell friends, and you know it's really going to be taught in a way that it won't offend a, a, a non-Christian or somebody who's not too familiar with this. But it, you know, everybody has pain in their life that that they have to deal with, and this is a way to, that helps us do that. Um, but one of the things we used to do is hand out CDs, and that's one of the reasons that we charge money because we had to cover the cost of that, and it took a lot of time to make them. But now we're in the age of the internet. <laughs> So you can go to our YouTube channel, and you can get the first week's class that this is going to be your homework that we'll give out on Tuesday night is to listen to this. If you want to get a head start on it, that's available now. So just go up on our YouTube channel, and you can start listening to it. It's not a video. You know, normally you think of YouTube, you think of videos. But we're able to post audio on, on YouTube so you can listen to it in an accessible way, and it's also on Facebook on our Facebook page. So either one of those ways you can get it. We're trying to give you as many ways to get this information in as possible. Did you ever notice that you read a book and then you hear it on audiobook and you hear things differently when you listen to the audiobook than when you read it? It's funny how that works, isn't it? So m the more ways we have to get this information in, the better. It's really our spirit, man, that that is awakened. And it's also, it's the, how do I say it? You go through things in life and your week is busy and you're not always fully engaged with what you're reading or what you're listening to. So different times, you could be looking at the same thing and pick up something new this time than you did last time because you were distracted the last time. And look, sometimes your life changed. Maybe you went through the course a few years ago, but you're very different today than you were three years ago. And when you look at it now, you're going to see it through today's lens, hopefully more mature and you're a different creature than you were then. And now all of a sudden that truth drops in and, and it explodes like a seed growing. Um, so that's, that's the reason. We're trying to give you as many ways to get this. If you could just get this on Amazon, you can go on our YouTube and, and get this. And that'll be every week. Whatever the homework assignment is that week, you'll get it on, uh, on our YouTube channel. So this is my picture of the week. I love this little boy. And, um, you know, it's just a, a little boy in his father's arms. And if you're a real veteran of King of Kings, you remember that we used to sing a song. And the, the tagline was, I fear nothing at all when I'm safe in the arms of my, of my father. And if ever I fall, I take comfort in knowing that you are there. And, uh, you know, boy, that's a good, a good thing to remember because it's hard to remember that this is the relationship we have with our father and how, how safe we should feel when we're, when we're in the arms of our father. You're always in the arms of your father. He never leaves you or forsakes you. But the circumstances you go through could make you feel, what happened? I feel abandoned. You're not. You could feel that way, but we don't walk by our feelings. We hear the word of God, and our faith increases. Faith comes by hearing. Come on. And hear by the word of God. So that's what we're going to do today. And I'm going to reference this little guy. I don't know what his name is, but I'm going to... I'm going to reference him a lot because if you look closely at this picture, he doesn't seem at all stressed out, does he? There's something about knowing the safety of a father's embrace that allows you to relax and know that you're protected. And one of the biggest ways the enemy tries to attack us is that he tries to attack our identity. And it was really powerful. Um, this, My wife and I were watching it yesterday. Um, about Russ Taff, I guess it would be like a documentary on his life. And I remembered him because, you know, he was very popular when I first became a Christian, and I'm a musician, so I remember Russ Taff well. And he didn't have the right identity. And even though he was a Christian and he sold platinum records in, in the kingdom, there was still a part of him that was broken from growing up in a home with a father who was an abusive alcoholic. And it wasn't Russ, Russ Taff's fault that his father was an abusive alcoholic. His father was a pastor. And was an abusive alcohol, abusive. So look, you know, who would ask for that? Nobody would ask to land in that family. And yet it all turned around at the end when, at the end of this story, when he finally got embraced by a man of God who imparted the father's blessing to him. <laughs> now you look at this picture. Try to get a piece of paper between this little boy and his father. You can't slip anything in between there, could you? 
because it's an embrace. And when there's an embrace, nothing can wedge that thing open except lies. And that's a chief tactic. It says in the Bible that the devil is the father of lies. What a contradiction. Father should imply I could trust you like this little boy is trusting his dad right here. He's the father of lies. So when Satan embraces you, you can be sure he's going to lie. But we believe in some lies. And the truth of the word of God is the only thing that can break that lie, man. So I'm going to end, I'm going to start, excuse me, where we ended last week with this verse. I had you speak this to each other. So do you mind standing? Add an honor to the word of God. And we'll just speak it into the atmosphere. We'll pray and then we'll get started. It's from the Passion Translation, Ephesians chapter 3, and it starts with verse 16. Ready? Say yes. yes. All right, good. And I pray that he would unveil within you the unlimited riches of his glory and favor until supernatural strength floods your innermost being with his divine might and explosive power. Then, by constantly using your faith, the life of Christ will be released deep inside you, and the resting place of his love will become the very source and root of your life. So, Lord, we just embrace this portion of Scripture, that you have filled us with your glory and favor and your supernatural strength floods our innermost being. Your divine might and explosive power have filled us we are your sons and daughters in this house, and that explosive power can break the power of lies that have tried to control us. The truth will set us free. And by constantly using our faith, your life, the life of Christ, will be released deep inside us, and our resting place will be in your love. We will be like that little boy, resting and at ease, knowing that we are safe in the arms of our Father, Lord, you said if we dwell in that secret place of the Most High God and abide under the shadow of the Almighty, we will say of the Lord, you are our refuge. And we speak it out today that you are our refuge and our strength, the God in whom we will trust. Amen. You can be seated. All right, I just keep working on this thing here. I'm going to go back to the picture just one more time because I want to try to burn it in a little bit to you here, right? And that language that um, is used in the Passion Translation is very, uh, very full of life and vibrant. And, and it's important that when you read your Bible that your time with the Lord is full of life and vibrant. Sometimes it can feel like an obligation that I have to just check the box. And who wants you to be distracted when you read the Bible? devil. You're really not supposed to just read it. You're supposed to do what? Study to show yourself approved, right? Why do you have to study? Because the world we live in is so opposite to what the truth of the word says that we have to keep reminding ourselves what the truth is, not the lie that's being presented to us. So that never stops for the rest of our lives. And that's why memorizing scripture is so powerful. But it's also why worship is such a secret weapon of the kingdom. Because if you're singing songs like we did this morning that are all tied back to Scripture, it's another way of having it repeat inside your spirit, man. And you're being refreshed in your thought life just because the Word of God is coming to you. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the glory. Forever, amen. Why wouldn't you want that on your jukebox? As opposed to the suicide music that the kids listen to today with the heavy metal music. It'll kill you. And he wants to give you life. So every way you get the Word in there through every different portal in every angle, your eyes, your ears, your spirit, man, memorize scripture. It all builds your immune system against the lies of the enemy. And I love this picture, so I'll go back to it. But here's where I want to go next. It says in, um, in Colossians 1, go to the next one right after Ephesians. We pray that you would be energized with all his explosive power. <laughs> there it is again. See, that's exousia. Dunamis power, explosion. I pray that you will be filled with explosive power. For what? To be able to withstand the wiles of the enemy. To be able to recognize when somebody's lying to you. To have discernment. In, in this morning's theme during worship, it was all about healing relationships. 
Well, look, you know, there's a lot of baggage already lined up there that caused it to be hurtful in the first place. I remember being a little kid and being at a wedding, and I looked at my parents and said, I never met those cousins over there. Who were they? And it was like, they have the same name as us. It's like, oh, we had a family fight 40 years ago, and they don't talk to us anymore. <laughs> Nobody even remembered what the fight was about. Yeah, 40 years. It's not just Italians, but we're pretty good at holding a grudge. Got to let it go. You're the one in pain. You're the one holding on that grudge. It's poisoning your system, right? You're the one who gets free when you forgive them and release them. But that doesn't come natural to us. We want them to be the first one to apologize, however it works. So there's explosive power. It's also for healing. It's also for all forms of demonstration of signs, wonders, and miracles. There's explosive power in you. And that's what Che was saying. I don't know if you remember the story he told when he was here, but he went to that, that room to pray for somebody, and he felt like the Lord gave him a, a prophetic word. He was asked to come and perform last rites for, uh, I think he said, 90-year-old woman. Do you remember? And, um, and all of a sudden, the Lord said to him, I want you to pray that she's going to come out of the coma because I want to save her before she dies. And he was like a little freaked out. You're not used to getting that kind of message right in the moment like that. But he knew the, the voice of the Lord well enough to know. He starts praying over her. Do you remember what he said? And she sat up. And I don't quote it verbatim here, but he, she basically said, I, I could still hear. I wasn't able to speak, but I, my, I was alert in the spirit. And I prayed to the Lord that he'd send somebody here so I could be saved before I die. Okay? So, like, who the heck are we to figure out God? Just be obedient, even if it feels a little foolish sometimes. There's explosive power from the what? The realm. Do you see that word? The realm. We're going to keep seeing this word, realm, throughout the different scriptures we look at today. And, and you understand what that means, what a realm is. It's a place of authority. So when we say the kingdom of God in the earth, it's the realm where God's power has authority over your life. Remember that young girl in Columbine who gave her life because the, the shooter put the gun to her and, and said, if you don't renounce Christianity, I'm going to kill you. Do you remember this? And what did she do? She said, I can't renounce Christianity. Other people heard it. That's how we know. We never would have heard her story. And they were so convicted about her belief system that they got saved because there were a lot of people that survived it and heard it. See, that's the realm. That's when you know whose authority is over your life. When your life is on the line, that's whose authority you're under. And she showed it. Young girl, 16, 17 years old, had it so grounded in her that she wasn't given in. We know where she is today. She's a martyr for the kingdom. Amen? So there's a realm that we're going to keep seeing this word, and I want to point it out now because there's a lot of different ways that we're going to see it. And this is a realm of his magnificent glory, and it fills you with great hope. Your hearts can soar with joyful gratitude when you think of how God made you worthy to receive the glorious inheritance freely given to us by living in the light. <laughs> That's a mouthful, isn't it? What's the glorious inheritance? Some people think it's getting into heaven when you die. It's part of it. Part of it is that we're living this life in relationship with God and getting all the benefits of this life here. It's not like, Lord, hurry up, come back and get me out of here because it's such a mess. It's like, no, use me to bring light into the darkness and to be able to do what Cheon did and have such an open portal that you tell me to do something, I'm obedient enough to do it, and it causes that person to get saved or to get healed. Because if they're not a believer and they get healed, do you think it's a little easier for them to get saved if they're healed? Yeah, that's signs and wonders. Makes them wonder. Maybe it's real. But... It, a lot of them had bad experiences as children in, in organized religion, and they just threw Jesus out with the bathwater. But let's bring them a real Jesus. Amen? Yeah, okay. I love this. He has rescued us completely from the tyrannical rule of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom realm of his beloved son. There you go. There's another realm, the kingdom realm of his beloved son, the realm of glory that was in heaven. And now the realm here, you are translated out of darkness and into the marvelous light of the Lord. Amen? Chosen generation, a royal priesthood. Anybody a peculiar person here? 
what, what makes us peculiar is that authority lines up with the Word of God. And when other people want to do stuff, you don't necessarily want to go. Because you know nothing good can come from that. Not like you're trying to be church lady. It's like, I want to protect my spirit. If I had to fight Mike Tyson, I don't think I'd eat a gallon of ice cream before I got in the ring. It's hard enough, isn't it? So if it's hard enough, why should I make it worse by getting drunk? It's hard enough to control your appetites that you're going to get yourself drunk and you're going to lose control of your ability to have discipline in your life. Who loves it when you lose control? The devil. Because then you make one mistake, it costs you for the rest of your life. Just because you let your guard down once. Man, he's not worth it, is it? He's not worth it. So you're getting me with this realm? I like this commentary. So when Paul speaks of God rescuing people from one kingdom and giving them another one, and of redemption and forgiveness as central themes of that rescue operation, he has the exodus from Egypt in mind. Okay? You got to remember who he's talking to. First century Christians were also converted Jews. And when they heard freedom, because they, they celebrated Passover every year, right? We still celebrate it. They came out of Egypt. That was the Passover. That was, they're up against the Red Sea. The Egyptians are closing in on them. Yet God opened up the Red Sea and they got through. And then the sea swallowed up. And Miriam sang, the horse and the rider. He's thrown into the sea. I will sing unto the Lord. For he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and the rider. He's thrown into the sea, right? So we're being told by this man who wrote this commentary, don't forget that when you read this, because it was a shift from persecution and bondage to freedom. Yeah. But how many remember this when you first got saved? It took a while to really understand what the freedom meant, because you were so used to doing those old bondage things that you're still in your mindset, you're like a child that needs to grow into that new relationship with the Lord, right? Because like cursing, I use that as an example sometimes because people, guys especially, if they're out on a construction site or it really doesn't matter where you are anymore, cursing just becomes such a part. You could be a Christian but have a hard time realizing you're even doing it because it just came such a part of your life. And then, you know, we're, we love one another. We just say, hey, bro, I don't know if you even realize how that sounds, but the Bible says that's a sin. Now, I know you're not doing it intentionally, but let's, I just got to point it out to you because I love you and, and nothing good can come from that. And whatever, it's a cultural thing, right? So why would it be different 10 years into your salvation? There could be an area in your life that has ha had arrested development. You could be booming in all these other areas, but in, in Russ Taft's case, he didn't understand the full impact of the trauma. In fact, he had blocked out many of the things that happened to him as a child in order to just preserve his sanity because it was so crazy. And part of his healing came when, when counselors, Christian ministers, got him to understand what happened to him and allowed him to cry through it. And once he cried through it, he could grapple with it and forgive his father. There was another lady that Sanford spoke about. I'm sorry if you've heard this already, but maybe you haven't. She was in Romania, and then the, the wall fell. I forget the exact timing of it was, but she was helping children in an orphanage and, and there was a shift in the government and she had no time. She had a little window of time to escape because any American citizens were going to get in trouble if they were there. So she barely got a chance to say goodbye to these kids. This was her whole life. She was a missionary. Her whole life was helping these kids out and she had to leave immediately and fly out of the country. When she landed here, she couldn't stop crying. And there was a placement center from the mission agency that was trying to give her places to stay. And uh, they got a call like a week after she would get to a new house and said, we can't help her. And it's really hard having her here because she can't stop crying. Can you find another home? So she lands in the third or fourth home. And all of a sudden, the people there with her just start crying with her. Wow. Jesus. Within three days, it stopped. Wow. It gradually let down because... They cared enough, right? And the Bible says that. There's a scripture that says, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Not so easy to do, is it? Because you got to put down everything else you were thinking of doing, and you got to really let them know, I'm feeling what you're feeling right now, and you can offload onto the Jesus in me. Not onto me. I'm not a hero. But you can yoke yourself up to the Jesus in me, and we're going to get through this thing together. 
and I don't care how many days it takes, we're going to cry this thing through together. Not even knowing that that would heal her, but that's the thing that healed her. You see? Like, you never know where the angle's coming from that the enemy's going to try to use against you. And, and you can look at all the good things that are going on in your life, and that's great. But if, like in Russ Taft's case, he was a platinum-selling recording artist, but there was just this still big thing hanging in his life that wasn't getting addressed. And it's, uh, it was very hard for the people around him to know what to do. The love of God broke through, amen? So that Egypt became the promised land. Through the hug of a father, giving him a father's blessing, he went from Egypt's slavery bondage to the promised land. And then he had to learn how to walk in the promised land. Because after you've been a slave for a long time, some of those habits try to carry over into the promised land with you, don't they? Like mumbling and complaining. <laughs> so what he said, you could read it, it says, this is the new exodus in the New Testament. He's talking about the new exodus of being saved, coming out of the bondage to sin, and now walking in the freedom of being a child of God. Not religious, a relationship, a child with God. This new exodus, the great moment of setting slaves free to become a Christian, is to leave the Egypt of sin and to travel gratefully towards the promised inheritance. So really, that's a part of what we're talking about with this, too, is wherever you're at right now, it doesn't matter how long you've been saved, how many times you've read the Bible, there could still be something in there that's acting like one of those little foxes that spoil the vine. And if you're not sure, you can ask your spouse. They may have an idea about one of those little foxes that might be there. They're usually willing to give you an honest appraisal if you ask them. John Wimber said, the one prayer God always answers is, what's wrong with me? <laughs> He'll always answer that. Why? Because he loves you. And if you ask your spouse, they're probably willing to help you with that one too. <laughs> Look at the promises that we get. All, this is all, I'm only reading from Colossians and Ephesians. Now we're in Colossians. It says, all the guilt and power of sin has been cut away and is now extinct. That's a good promise to remember. It's a dinosaur. It's extinct. It doesn't live anymore. So forget about Jurassic Park, man. Nobody's going to get a dinosaur to live again. If you think it's extinct, then you're not going to fall victim to the lie of the enemy that it was your fault and that shame. doesn't mean we don't make mistakes, but there's no condemnation in the mistakes. There's Holy Spirit to bring conviction to us to say, you have to do better in this area. This is not God's best for your life. But... It's extinct because of what Christ has accomplished for us. We were raised with him. That means resurrected, right? We were raised with him when we believed in God's resurrection power. The power that raised him from what? Amen. Death what? Realm. See again. There's a death realm and there's a glorious realm, a kingdom realm, the kingdom realm of his son. Which one do you want to live in? Pretty easy choice. Not the death realm. But it's rampant in America today. It's so confusing to look at the statistics. Our economy is booming. Jobs are, the, the, the unemployment rate is lower than it's been in, I don't know how many years, 60, 70 years. It's a little issue with the China tariffs, you know, that trade war thing going on. But look, things are going really well in the economy of America right now. And yet there's more suicide and more opioid addiction than we've ever had. The, the first time... I don't remember in how long. I think it's over 100 years. It's the first time that our life expectancy has dropped in America. Ne medicine's never been you know, more available or, or better quality to keep you alive longer. And yet the pain in people's lives is causing them to take their own life or medicate their pain with opioids or what do they call that um, heroin that's out now? Fentanyl that like one grain of it can kill you. Touching something that had it on it could kill you. Apparently that's how strong. You think the devil's happy about that drug? Yes. Why? He seeks to steal, kill, and destroy, but God has come to give you life, and that more abundantly. You don't have to medicate your pain when you're in right relationship with the Lord. That's not meaning to be condemning. Just a goal to get to. You get it. Verse 13 says, this realm of death describes our former state. For we were held in sin's grasp, but, don't you love that? Don't you love that in the Bible? But God, see? We were, that's past tense, we were 
held in that realm of death, sin's grasp, but now we've been resurrected out of that realm of death, never to return. That's the confession that you have to keep making over yourself. Every time the devil lies, say, you know what? That used to have power over me, devil, but I know the truth now, and the truth has set me free. I'm no longer in your grip. I've been set free by the resurrection power of the Lord. And yes, what, you know, the accusation of the enemy is usually true. He brings out something you did wrong. You didn't stop doing things wrong when you became a Christian, but you hopefully weren't doing it intentional. So when you did, you just own it soon and say, you know what? I didn't handle that right. Would you forgive me? Ask for forgiveness. That breaks the hold of sin off of you because you sought the forgiveness. person might still be mad at you. It might take a little while to get it, but it says in the Bible... As much as it's within your power, pursue peace with all men. So you can hit, do your half. If they want to hold a grudge, that's all right. But you did your part. You sought the forgiveness. Amen? Yeah. All right. So never to return. I've been resurrected out of that realm of death. Never to return. You become a Christian, you never die. Though this life ends, you live forever. And we're going to come back and rule and reign with him forever too. I'm only on verse 14. In Colossians 1, it says, For in the Son all our sins are canceled, and we have the release of redemption. And I put in there, from Egypt. You've been redeemed from slavery. You were bound by the sin of Egypt, but now you've been released. So you have the release of redemption through his very blood. Can you see how that's the Red Sea? Isn't that a beautiful comparison of Jesus' blood with the Red Sea? I mean, why did it have to be a Red Sea? Because it was representing the blood of Jesus. That's how you come out. He came and died for you, and it's through that blood. You're not coming through that empty sea anymore. You're coming through that blood to know the Father, to know the Father, not an angry God, the Father. No man comes to the Father except through the Son. I think we minimize that a little bit. He didn't say no man comes to God. No man comes to the Father. It's that relationship of Father to Son and the Son has the authority of the Father. So when the Son sets you free, you're free indeed. Not like a servant. And then verse 22. I love this one. He says he, he released his supernatural peace to Peter Roselli. Put your name in there. You can do that with the Bible. You know that, right? This is a personalized love letter from God to you. He released... His supernatural peace to Peter Roselli through the sacrifice of his own body and the, as the sin payment on Peter's behalf so I could dwell in his presence. And you start confessing this out loud and you make this a part of your prayer time, you, the, the lies just don't stick anymore because you just keep reminding yourself who you are in Christ. And I'm a son. And just keep picturing that little boy hugging his dad. I'm a son. You can't even slip a piece of paper in here to lie to me, Satan, because this sand is making it like glue between us. I'm safe in the arms of my father. This is what he did for me. Right? You've heard that line that if there was only one human being on the planet, Jesus still would have came and gave his life for that one person. Every life is equally valuable. You're saying amen now, but wait till we get to bitter root judgments. <laughs> You're going to be like sinking in your seat because, you know, we believe that every life is valuable, but we don't treat people like we believe every life is valuable. <laughs> Guilty. Not intentionally, really, not intentionally. But it's so easy to form an opinion, to jump to a conclusion before you've had a chance to speak to the person or know what their life is like and what they've gone through to get here. I go to New York City and I see people walking that look like they probably should have even made it out of the house. And they're walking around on their walker and they might be going this slow. But they weren't going to stay home. You know, and I'm like, you're a hero, man. You're a hero because the easy way out would just be to bail on the whole thing and just give up. And like, no. I'm going. You're not stopping me. And that's the kind of mindset that we need. You know, the bunny, Energizer bunny, you keep going. That, that thing that hits the wall and bounces and keeps on going and keep, it keeps finding a way. The, the enemy doesn't want you there. The enemy wants you depressed and under the covers, staying in bed all day. 
No way. No way. He released his supernatural peace to me through the sacrifice of his own body as a sin payment on my behalf so I would dwell in his presence. His presence is with me all the time because he loves me. Why does he want to be with me? Because he loves me. Even if people don't, he does. And now there is nothing between you and the Father God. For he sees you as holy, flawless, and restored. Some of you don't believe that. I'm telling you, I know it. Some of you don't believe it. This is the word of God. It's true. He sees you as holy, flawless, and restored. So the next time your spouse says something negative about you, say, well, God sees me as holy, flawless, and restored. So take that. That's right in the Bible. Well, that passion translation, man, I don't know if I like that passion translation. That's because you need a little more passion. <laughs> I mean, like, this is not a, a new thought, what I'm about to say, but just meditate on this for a minute. I'd say a majority of the people that you meet haven't had an encouraging word from an authority figure in years. Most people, not everybody, because there are people that have had great relationships with authority figures. But, but here's the deal. What I have found in life is that it's harder to do that. It's hard to encourage people, and it's much easier to put a guilt trip on them. It's much easier to rule with fear than to rule with love. And if the society accepts that, they won't say they accept it. But you can tell by their silence that they accept it. And that on the job especially, right? Like, anybody heard that one? You don't like the job? There's 10 other people waiting for this one. So you don't like it? Leave. Don't let the door hit you on the way out. And, and in Wall Street, that's true. There are more than 10 people waiting for your job. And some of them work in your company. So if they can make you look bad, oh, yeah. That's their God is to keep going after mammon. The love of money is the root of all evil. It's never enough, by the way. No matter how high you climb up the ladder, you still have another one to go. I mean, if that's not the devil, what is? You don't ever get there. There's no there. I had a guy, he said, I love my boat until a bigger boat came by. <laughs> and then I hated my boat. <laughs> like, doesn't that sum up the devil? He keeps teasing you with things, making you think you're going to be happy, and then you're not. So then you get it, and then you need more of whatever that thing is. Fill in the gap. He's a liar. But the Lord sees me as holy, flawless, and restored. You need to look at the person that's who say, The Lord sees me as holy, flawless, and restored. So you should too. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, I don't know that you will do what I'm about to say, but if you did, if you ever went back and looked at why Christianity became as popular as it did, and it still is the most popular form of worship on the planet, there's more people that are Christians and Muslims or anything else, okay? Still today, in spite of the decline of the Catholic Church and all that, there's been a charismatic renewal all over the world. Um, who did we hear say it recently? There's a billion uh, evangelical Pentecostals. I think it was Cheyenne, right? And he said 800 million of the billion are now charismatic Pentecostals. <laughs> okay? Uh, you know, you could talk to him if you're not sure. But, you know, this is all just since 1906. That's not a long time to get 800 million people converted to charismatic Christianity. But why did it become popular? Because it really stood no chance. In the natural, when you looked at it, this was a poor, what they would have said is a poor Jewish carpenter who wasn't even educated, who only lasted for three years in ministry, and the Romans crucified him. So who would serve a crucified God? And remember what he said, it's good that I go, because if I go, who could come? The comforter. So that was the missing ingredient that they didn't see in the Roman Empire, is that by killing Jesus, it's going to spread his presence into anybody who would receive him. And now they'll be filled with his presence. And just like he was willing to die, they're going to be willing to die. And it only took 400 years, and Christianity was the, the Roman Empire's religion. Impossible. So historians that aren't believers keep looking at this like, how the heck did this happen? Because they don't get the Holy Spirit part, see? They can't understand that. 
And here's the thing. If you remember the movie by, uh, that was around the book, uh, the guy that we saw, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on it, Case for Christ, Lee Strobel. He was a lawyer working for a newspaper. His wife got saved at Bill Hybels Church in Chicago, and this guy was flipping out. He was not happy. He was an atheist. He was not happy that his wife became a Christian. There was a Christian on his job, so he walks up to this guy, and he said, my wife joined your cult. <laughs> I want you to help me tell her how to get out of it. <laughs> now, how much you know, patience would that guy need? Like, who are you calling it a cult? This is the most important thing in my life. You're calling it a cult? But he had the presence of mind and the presence of Holy Spirit in his life. I doubt he was expecting that question that day. But yet, this is what he said. At least Lee Strobel said that that scene was accurate of the way it happened because we got to talk to him at this event that we were at. And he said, here's what you do. It's easy. You want to disprove Christianity? Just disprove the resurrection and you'll win. Would you have known to say that? But now you do. <laughs> See? You learned something. You get a bagel, coffee, and that little, that little hint. Are we having fellowship today? Oh, good. <laughs> Saved by the bell. <laughs> Man, like, dwell on that. The resurrection is the key to the whole thing. They saw him. 500 people saw him. So it's much more likely that they were willing to die when they saw the resurrected Christ because they knew no matter what, we win because we're going to be resurrected too. Some of them were going into the Colosseum knowing they were going to be eaten by lions singing worship songs. It's true. It's in church history. See, it's the mindset. And here we are. We complain over little things. They had their life on the line. But I'm not saying, you know, I'm not trying to condemn anybody, but... When you really read it and you understand what they had to go through compared to what we have to go through, it's amazing that they laid the groundwork for us like that. Amen? So that's what he's saying. The behavior which marked, this is commentary again, which marked out so much of the world at their time, first century Palestine, right? Roman Empire. The behavior was what? Lust, anger, lies. Think that's still happening? Yeah. <laughs> Has anything changed? <laughs> no. So the behavior that marked out their day still marks out our day. And it split up the community and the families, but it was replaced in the Christians by kindness and gentleness and forgiveness and acceptance of one another as members of what? Oh, man, this is real basic, but it's hard to do, isn't it? Even like the, the people that clean the office at the end of the day where I was working, I think I told you this, but I'll just say it again. Like nobody knew her name. The guys I worked with, they would just walk right past her. They didn't know her name. Like, they didn't even treat her like a human being because they weren't even aware she was there. They walked right past her because there was no immediate benefit of knowing her. And that's wrong. See, that's what I'm saying. That's why that bitter root judgment piece is that you're judging people un unjustly. It's God. It could be an angel, the Bible says. So don't do it. Start by believing the best. 1 Corinthians 13, 7, in the Amplified, love believes the best. So what these people were doing, not anger and lies and lust, it was being replaced by kindness and gentleness and forgiveness. And the Roman Empire just melted because they didn't know how to deal with kindness and gentleness. They were used to the anger and the lust and killing everybody that disagreed with you, my forefathers. <laughs> oh, the gospel doesn't just produce a new religious experience. For those who might like such a thing, it brings about something much greater, nothing less than, a little louder, please, nothing less than new creation. You and I are new creations in Christ. Any man be in Christ, new creation. That's so encouraging, isn't it? And Russ Taft had to hold on to that too, because even though this thing was so trying to kill him, he aged so much. You, you know, to look at this. Uh, at this uh, movie that we saw, which I guess, yeah, it's more like a documentary. He looks much older than he is because that's the wages of sin. That's what was happening. He kept drinking himself to just numb the pain. And, and then that caught up with him. But, you know, now that he's saved, he's got sparkle back in his eyes, but his body has still been worn down. See, but that spirit on the inside is still bright. But that's because the wages of sin is death, right? 
So look, man, it's a better thing that we have. New creation, again, I'm sorry, it's a commercial, but that's really where we're going here. What part of our life still needs to be a new creation? And if Jesus told us that we should pick up our cross daily, <laughs> that means something needs to die. <laughs> something inside us needs to die every day. So there's nothing wrong with this idea that I'm not perfect and that I haven't yet arrived. It's like, no, but today's another day. Lord, show me what needs to go today. And he'll be very good about that. You ready? I'm almost done. Colossians 2.14, he, can he canceled every legal violation that we had on our record. And the old arrest warrant that stood to indict us, he erased it all. Our sins, our stained soul, he deleted it all. And they cannot be retrieved. You know the psalm, right? As far as the east is from the west, that's how far he's removed our transgression. Everything we once were in Adam has been placed into, onto his cross and nailed permanently there as a public display of cancellation. Remind the devil of this, please, next time he tries to condemn you. Next verse, 15. Then Jesus made a public spectacle of all the powers and principalities of darkness, stripping away from them every weapon and all their spiritual authority and power to accuse us. So they only have authority if you give them authority. They have power because the power of a believed lie is real. If you believe the lie, it's got power over you. You're no good. You might as well just drink yourself to death because nobody cares about you anyway. That's what the devil would say, right? And you need the word of God to spring up and say, no, 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 no. It's the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. God came to give me life abundantly, more abundantly than what I have. Now, this is an interesting analogy that Paul is using. Again, it's very current to the times that they were in because they were living in the Roman Empire. So this picture that he's making here for us is a public spectacle of all the powers stripping away from them the weapons that they had. And, and by the power of the cross, Jesus led them around as prisoners in a procession of triumph. He was not their prisoner. They were his. I know some of you know what I'm about to say, but in case there's people who don't. So you remember singing that song? That was the first time I ever heard this verse where it said, his train fills the temple from the book of Revelation. I thought it was a train. I was a Christ, new Christian. How would I know that, it, that it's the train like, a, like a, a, a wedding gown that has the long train? So it's spelled T-R-A-N-E. I thought it was T-R-A-I-N. <laughs> what did I know? That's all I knew about a train. So why would his train fill the temple? They got trains in heaven? Like I didn't know what he was talking about. And then all of a sudden I realized when, you know, when I read about it and I, and I looked it up, the emperor in Rome had a long robe and every time they would conquer another nation, they would sew in that, that country's flag on the back of that robe. So you were measured as an emperor by how many of these robes were trailing behind you on a, like a train behind you, you see it? So when they conquered people, they didn't just kill them, they kept some as prisoners to bring them back into Rome, and they would march them through the streets. This once powerful army is now being marched through the street, making a public display of them openly, stripped of their weapons, stripped of their armor. You could read it. It's right there. Stripping away from them every weapon and all their spiritual authority and power to accuse us. So what did Jesus do? He made an open spectacle of the devil, stripped him of all his power and authority, took his robe, tied it to the temple, and then he was executed. And that's what they would do. They would execute the king. But this remnant down here that's still trying to harass us is real. So you can't ignore it. The enemy is killing people. Suicide rates have never been higher in America. Opioid deaths have never been higher. There's hurting people all around us. But light belongs in the darkness. We don't belong in the bunker trying to, like, just huddle up. Oh, it's so bad out there. That's not a soldier. It's not the Christians. They're early Christians. They, they were ready to, to take this thing by force. All right. So to put death, I'm sorry, here's, here's our command to us. Paul is saying in Colossians 3, put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. That's a powerful word, lurking, isn't it? What would you think if somebody was lurking around you? It's got like kind of an evil little shadow to it, doesn't it? Like a lurker, a stalker. Yeah, see, and they're in you, and they're there. 
So put to death those things that are lurking. And, and that's where that self-examination comes into. What are the things that I'm having a hard time with that are lurking out there ready to try to get me? Put them to death. Don't try to fix them or band-aid them. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. You used to do those things when your life was still part of the world, but now is the time to get rid of anger and rage and malicious behavior and slander and dirty language. And you know there's a long list, right? How do I do this? Please, somebody, tell me, how do I do this? That's part of what we're going to try to cover. See, that's, that's this journey that you're going on for six weeks, however long. You know, the class is going to go six weeks, but hopefully it sticks with you. And you go, you know what? I want to be a vessel that contains his, his honor, a vessel of honor in the house of the Lord. I want to possess my vessel in sanctification and honor. And nobody's fully arrived. So why wouldn't I go on this journey with the Lord and let him show me where there might still be things that aren't perfectly lined up yet? We should. It's like an offensive posture that we're going to take and say, things aren't going horrible for me. My life's not a terrible mess. But I, I'm sure that there's ways he could use me at a higher level in some areas, right? That's just a humble approach to life. There is. He can. But it's not so easy to just get rid of them. He says, put them to death and get rid of them. But if you don't get to the root source of the problem, like Russ Taft had to do in this documentary, he had blocked it out so badly that he didn't make the connection between his dad being a, uh, really, he was a rageaholic and an alcoholic, and worse yet, a pastor. So that meant he was representing God. So God is angry. So I got, I got nobody. My father doesn't love me in a, hug, in a way that shows affection. And God must be angry, too, because he represents God. So it was a perfect storm of, of a disaster. But God, see? But God, he goes and meets this pre preacher who died a week later. The man that prayed for him. That's why he went to visit him. He was dying. But the man looked just like his father, and the man was a minister, and he got up and just prayed over him and blessed him with the Father's blessing. And it was gone in a week. Changed his life forever. That's not a coincidence. That's a God incidence. Amen. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature. See, see how it's the same thing he was just saying? You stripped the power off the enemy. So you have stripped off the power of your old nature and all its wicked deeds and put on your new nature. Be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. Finish two more. Psalm 91, and then we'll finish with, with uh, Colossians. You know this one already, but it's still so good to think about it in relation to that little boy in his father's arms, right? He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge and my fortress. My God in him I will trust. A thousand may fall at your side. Ten thousand at your right hand. Come on, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. Memorize these verses. I'm telling you, make this become part of your arsenal against the lies of the enemy. The truth sets you free. You will know the truth and the truth. So it's only the truth you know that sets you free. Fair? And going to just come automatically. You put your Bible under your pillow then come by osmosis. Could, I guess. Might as well try it. <laughs> it still says study. All right, let's stand. We'll finish here. Colossians 3.1. Hopefully the idea of crucifixion isn't so scary. Because he said, pick up your cross daily. So crucifixion just means that thing in your life that needs to be put to death. Not fixed. Put to death and we're trusting him to raise up that new thing. So if I have to put to, get, put to death anger, but I've gotten really good at using my anger to manipulate people, and now I have to put it to death, what am I going to use? Love. <laughs> that seems like a far concept, doesn't it? If for 50 years you've been using anger, and now you need to learn a new tool, but he'll show you. You'll get on the accelerated learning curve of the Holy Ghost. If you're willing to submit yourself, see, because you got so used to that old way of doing it, now it's a fresh start. It's a resurrection life. You're coming out of the grave, and he'll show you what to do. But it also teaches you humility and how you have to be interdependent with the Lord on the other side of the cross. He's going to show you how to do this. And everybody said...
he will show me how to do it, right? All right, here we go. Ready? Say it out loud. Therefore, if you have been raised with the Messiah, keep focusing on the things that are above where the Messiah is, seated at the right hand of God. Keep your minds on the things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life has been safely guarded by the Messiah in God. That's a really good way to look at it, amen? Safely guarded. See, it says hidden in other scriptures. It says hidden, but hidden seems like you're hiding. It's not that. You're not, you died, you, the old you died when you got born again. You got baptized, you came out, and you got resurrected into this new creation when you accepted Jesus, but you're not hiding. Your life is safely guarded. That's such a better way of saying it, see? This is a real version, uh, ISV, International Standard Version. Your life is safely guarded in God. You're in your Father's arms. See? You're not hiding. You're, maybe too much of the church thinks we're supposed to hide from the world. That's exactly opposite of the mission we're having. The, the Lord said, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you not to hide into the world to bring this love, bring this light. And the more you use those muscles, the better you'll get at it. And Cheon, clearly, you know, that's been a big part of his life. He, it was so evident from all the stories he was telling how many people's lives have been impacted by his evangelistic gift that he has. So look, I don't know what our gifts are. They're all different. Everybody here has a different package of gifts. But, but let's just offer them up to the Lord, okay? Lord, we thank you. That we're going to keep our minds on the things that are above, not on the things of this earth. We died to our old man, and now we are safely guarded by you in the Father. We're like that little boy in the Father's arms. So everywhere the enemy tries to bring up a lie, everything that's contrary to the truth of the word, Holy Spirit, we give you permission to set the alarm bell off in our spirit man to know this isn't right. That's not who I am. I know who I am in Christ. I'm who the Bible says I am. I'm who the word of God tells me I am, not who the father of lies is speaking over me. Let's just pray in case there's somebody here that's believing lies today, man. Maybe somebody here not even a Christian, and this is new to you. You came with a friend. You didn't know what this was going to be about, but something's resonating in your spirit, man. Or you are a Christian, but you have, feel like a failure because you haven't been able to get victory over this thing. Whatever that thing is, Jesus is stronger than the strong man. Remember last week? He spoils his good, and he shares that, those goods with us. He takes everything the enemy stole and gives it to us. Those are the spoils of war. So don't believe that lie. Take a stand right now against that lie. And if you're not a believer, if you're not a Christian, if you haven't accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, let today be the day. This is a great day for a spiritual birthday. And no better time than right now. Let's just pray a prayer together if that's you and you haven't said yes to the Lord. Heavenly Father. I come to you in the name of Jesus. I have a new understanding of what Jesus did when he died on the cross and resurrected from the tomb. He did it to save me. I recognize I'm a sinner and I need a savior because I can't save myself. Please forgive me, Lord, for ignoring you or discounting who you were because now I see who you really are, a loving Father who wants to give me life abundantly here and for eternity with you. I repent of my sins. I humble myself before you. I ask you to forgive me and accept me into your kingdom. I receive Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior today and forever through eternity. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. This is, the, this is where the rubber meets the road now, right? This is where the church should really pray. It's like that seed comes out, and is it going to fall on good ground, right? And if you're not thinking of somebody in this room, there could be somebody watching, right? You never know how people find stuff. So if you said that prayer, and this is new for you, it's going to take a little act of courage now and just say, yes, that was me. I never said that prayer before. I never heard this message before. And I want this new creation that you've been talking about. Nobody's raising their hands. Okay, we're not going to put you in any 
kind of spotlight. We just want to know who to pray with. The enemy wants to steal that seed. Don't let him. Amen? All right, now, so then we'll shift. Anybody here need victory over bondage? Anybody here need victory? You don't have to raise your hand because we're going to have a prayer ministry team up here. But there's freedom available at the altar. Amen? So I'm just going to bless you, okay? I'm going to bless you that the power of God is able to transform you. 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, We are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. Say it with me. I am being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. Lord, I bless every person that's sitting here right now that that's true about each and every one of us here. We are not who the devil says we are. We're who you say we are. We walk in victory more than conquerors, the head and not the tail, and we're going to go out and show your glory to this world like we sang. Lord, the whole earth is going to be filled with your glory, and it's going to come through us in Jesus' name. Amen. Have an awesome week. Hope you can make it on Tuesday night. If you need prayer, please come up.